The story starts with Rain Shroud getting called out by his party members. Arios tells Rain he is fired from the party, shocking Rain. Rain asks for the reason and Lean harshly says it was done because he is useless. At this, other members start mocking him and when he tries to talk, Arios tells him he shouldn't since he'll be pathetic. So Rain leaves the party along with returning the gear. Rain starts thinking about what he should do now in the city on the horizon. While he was still thinking, some children came to him and asked whether he had completed the job or not. Then they ask him to do the usual thing and Rain happily accepts. Rain sees an eagle flying and makes a temporary contract with it. He orders the eagle to say hello to the children, which makes the children very happy, and he decides to let the eagle go. The children tell Rain they'll become beast tamer just like him rather than being a hero. When Rain inquires about this, they say the other party members always look annoying, but Rain is different and always plays with them. At this, he remembers the people's annoying behavior whenever he talks about the hero party. Thinking for a while, he decides to become an adventurer. At the Adventurer's Guild, Rain gives his name for registration as an adventurer. He asks the guild receptionist, Nedalee Brow, to tell him about the adventurer's system. She gives him the essential knowledge and asks his class. Upon hearing Beast Tamer as his class, she becomes anxious, which makes Rain remember what Lean had told him before, but Rain says he'll be fine. He was then told to kill 10 goblins as a registration test. Using a squirrel, he tracked the goblins and started to attack them. He kills them off and collects the magic stones. He then hears someone scream only to find out a girl is being cornered by a killer tiger. He decides to act on his knife to attack it, but its skin is so hard that the knife breaks up. As the killer tiger cornered him, he witnessed the girl jump at a very high speed and slam the tiger. Rain sees that the girl is from the cat tribe, sent to be an endangered species. The girl falls and Rain asks whether she is okay or not. She says she is hungry. After Rain gives him some food, she gives him thanks and introduces herself as Kanad. While they start talking about themselves, Rain tells her about his banishment, which makes Kanad angry with the hero. This made Rain happy as she was angry with him and he patted her on her head, and she happily enjoyed it. She then asked Rain to tame her. At first, Rain wonders if it is possible to do so but feels that he wants to know Kanad better and try it, which turns out to be a success. At the Adventurer's Guild, Rain submits the items that he gained from his quest to the guild receptionist Natalie, who informs him that he's passed his adventurer's trial. With that, he's now recognized as an F-ranked adventurer, and he's given 50 copper coins for completing the quest. Natalie also states that although the payout is paltry, once Rain completes more quests, he'd rank up and earn more money for his troubles. With ranking up in mind, Rain notes that he'll need lodging, and to achieve this, we need to earn more money. Later, Rain meets with Kanad in the cafeteria, where he informs her that he's an official adventurer now and asks if she'd like to accept a quest. As Kanad happily accepts, a man approaches the two and takes an immediate interest in Kanad because she is a cat spirit. When the man tries to court Kanad, she refuses him, claiming that she belongs to Rain because he's her tamer. Finding it hard to believe, as cat spirits is one of the ultimate species, the man challenges Rain to an arm wrestling contest with Kanad as the prize. Despite his hesitancy, Rain accepts the challenge and instantly wins, much to his surprise. Just then, Natalie arrives and after observing the situation, apologizes to Rain and notes that the guild was aware of the man's antics and was considering suspending his license. Taking care of the man, Natalie formally apologizes on behalf of the guild. However, her inner voice leaks out when she asks Rain how he managed to tame Kanaid. This makes both Rain and Kanad shudder in fear, and Natalie regains her composure and takes away the man. Once Natalie is out of the picture, Rain wonders how he became so strong and Kanaid explains that once he made a contract with her, as a result, is thereby strength amplified. Rain's strength is believed to be as strong as Kanaid's, and Rain is a bit surprised by this as no one back in his village had this experience before. Excited to take on a new job, Kanaid's hopes are extinguished when they do herb gathering again. Kanaid complains that they should be doing a more extravagant job. However, Rain explains that because of his F rank, they're only allowed to complete basic jobs. Although psyched to do her best so they could gain more experience and rank up, Rain forms a temporary contract with some horned rabbits to collect their quota of herbs. As despondent over this as Kanad was, she hears screaming off in the distance and Rain suggests they check it out. At the location, an old man and his mule are surrounded by a group of bandits known as the Ebon Fangs. Hiding behind a nearby bush, Kanad informs Rain of the Ebon Fangs' infamous reputation as a brigade of bandits with a hundred members to their rankings. Although Kanad believes they should fall back and get help, Rain refuses and thinks they should take the bandits on themselves. Understanding her master's gumption, Kanad is told to rescue the old man while Rain deals with the bandits. The two then ambush the bandits, and as Rain deals with the bandits, Kanad checks on the old man while her inner monologue notes her worry that Rain may not be able to handle his newfound strength. 
However, as Kanan observes Rain fighting against the bandits, her heart starts to race, and when he finishes, Rain notices that Kanan's face is reddish and believes she is hurt. Kanan, however, denies the fact, and the old man speaks out to thank the two for their help. The old man then explains that a group of adventurers protected him. However, they flood when the bandits arrived, and he voices his concern over the reprisals of the Ebon Fangs. Briefly contemplating over it, Rain decides to deal with the rest of the Ebon Fangs, much to Kanae's dismay. En route to their destination, Rain temporarily contracts some animals around the surrounding area to scout out the Ebon Fangs. He also explains to Kanad his reason for wanting to deal with the remaining Ebony Fangs members, and assures her that he has a plan on how to do so. Soon, they reach the Ebony Fangs hideout, and Kanad is so dejected that a temporarily contracted animal once again beats her to the punch of an important task. Rain then apologizes to Kanad, who regains her composure, noting that she was only fooling around with Rain and asks him what the plan is from there on out. In his explanation, Rain details the plan hinges on another temporary contract with an Orbi, whose skill can paralyze a person for over 12 hours. Astonished that Rain could tame an insect despite being a beast tamer, he tells Kanad that back in his home village he learned the basics of the tamer's subclass insect taming for a while. As astonished as Kanad was, she's ordered to return to the town and get some reinforcements while he has the Orbis handle the Ebony Fang members. Although Kanana feels dejected again by her value as Rain's familiar, she snaps out of her emotional state and learns the need for reinforcements. The reinforcements that Rain wanted were called the Order of Knights, a group tasked by the government to uphold peace in the lands. Understanding her task, Kanae leaves and a swarm of Orbeez arrives and Rain forms a temporary contract with them all. Elsewhere, two of the three adventurers who were tasked with protecting the old man earlier before are revealed to have been Rain's old comrades Mina and Lean. The two curse their situation and how Arios and Agath were sucking it up with the nobility while they're forced to take on jobs as adventurers. They then redirect their frustrations to the beast tamer they were partnered with, opening their disdain for his inadequacy as a beast tamer. However, in his defense, the beast tamer claims that the demands of the two were far too complex for him to accomplish. He also claims that their notion that a beast tamer can tame over 20 animals is impossible, which Lean considers to be a lie and holds the beast tamer responsible for their failure. Accepting the responsibility after being coarse and threatened by Lee, she internally refuses to believe that Rain is any higher than the garbage she thought him to be. Returning to Rain's side, his Arby's deal with the remaining Ebony Fangs members and Kanad arrives with reinforcements. As the reinforcements handle the paralyzed bandits, Rain notices that only adventurers are there and not a single member of the Knights of Order. One of the reinforcements reveals that the Knights of Order had no time to deal with a bunch of cut purses. At that moment, a trio of Berserk King lizards break through their wooden cage and attack the Ebon Fang members and then Rain. Through the combined efforts of Rain and Kanine, they manage to take down the monsters, allowing the adventurers to carry the Ebony Fang members out of the area. Eventually, Rain and Kanine exit the Ebony Fang's base with Kanade holding onto King Lizard's magical stones, and they're then praised for their accomplishment by their fellow adventurers. The praise sits well with Rain, who recalls being kicked out of Ario's party for being useless, and is thankful for Kanade's help. Although Kanad was elated that they had actual beds to sleep on, Rain was flabbergasted that they had to share a room together thanks to the innkeeper. Rain's narration explains how after they turned in the bounty on the Ebony Fangs, they were recalled to the Adventurer's Guild. There, Natalie informs Rain he's been promoted from F rank to E rank, and they were given a sizable reward for their efforts. With their rewards, they purchased new equipment, celebrated by having a fancy dinner together, and finally ended up in their current predicament. Despite his apprehension, Rain agrees to share the room with Kanad for the night, and as Rain sleeps, she contemplates how fortunate she is to have been found by Rain. A week passes since Rain first met with Kanad, and in Rain's inner monologue, he explains his enjoyment of the laid-back adventuring lifestyle he and Kanad have been living thus far. From the Adventurer's Guild, they learn from Maitali that a hooligan has taken refuge at Stride Bridge and picks fights with anyone who tries to cross the bridge. Enticed by the five gold rewards, Rain accepts the quest and immediately heads to the bridge with Kanad. Shortly after they arrive, a red dragon flies overhead, lands close to the two, transforms into a female humanoid, and proclaims its desire to fight them. Surprised that the red dragon is really a woman, Rain asks if she's the noted guard dog of the bridge, which she confirms and introduces herself as Tanya, a dragonoid. Apparently, Tanya was using the bridge as a training ground for training, and Kanad explains to Rain that it's a form of pilgrimage to dragonoids, and Tanya confirms it. Tanya then openly challenges the two to a match, and both Rain and Kanad agree to the challenge. The battle starts with Tanya throwing a punch at Rain, who barely defends against it. Impressed by this feat, Tanya then breathes fire at the two, setting Kanade's tail on fire. 
Because of this, Kanad fights against Tamiya and Rain watches in amazement at how Kanad can fight against Tanya on an equal footing. To help Kanad, Rain tries to attack Tamiya, but she catches Rain as he soars in the air, grabs Kanad, and throws them into the air while preparing to breathe fire at them again. However, they manage to dodge the attack by working together, earning Tanya praise. Noting the difficulty of facing off against Tanya and how he needs to fight like a beast tamer, Rain asks Kanad to buy him three minutes to prepare. Without hesitation, Kanade agrees to help and faces off against Tanya as Rain forms a temporary contract on a bird and asks it to call for reinforcements. After this, Rain takes over and with the birds he contracted, they attack Tanya, who becomes immobilized after they attack her. Rain then reveals that the birds are called Pito and their plumage is poisonous. Tanya surrenders, incapable of fighting further, and Rain asks her to come with them. Questioning what would happen if she refused, Rain answers that he doesn't know but comments on what a fix he'd be in if Tanya doesn't comply. Amused by the response, Kanade pokes Tanya into submission, making her agree to the demand. Afterward, Rain and Kanade report back to Natalie at the Adventurer's Guild, and before Tanya can introduce herself, Rain stops her and abruptly leaves the guild in a hurry. Outside, Tanya draws attention to herself, and both Rain and Kanade stop her from revealing she's a dragonoid. On the outskirts of town, Tanya is disciplined by Rain, who allows her to leave, but admonishes her from starting any trouble again after this. However, Tanya, who had taken a liking to Rain, suggests that he tames her as well, to which he begrudgingly agrees and forms a contract with her. That night in town, Arios complains about his team's wasted efforts in the Lost Woods they spent trying to fight against monsters. With Leon and the others complaining that Rain's old tasks were a burden on the group, Arios decides to recruit Rain back into the group only to dump him again after they complete it. Meanwhile, as Rain sleeps on the floor, Kanade and Tanya argue about which bed the other sleeps on, as one of the beds has a view of Rain as he sleeps. In a narration, Rain explains that Slimes and his team were tasked with subjugating the monsters, which unsettles Kanade, due to their stickiness, whenever they're defeated. Tanya then boasts that she'll be able to defeat them all for her, which earns her Kanade's praise. Standing by watching the scene unfold, Rain notes how happy he was about how the two were getting along. Time passes by, and the group cannot locate a swarm of Slimes. Hence, Rain uses one of his taming abilities on a bird called Assimilate to merge his soul and control the bird to search for slimes within the area. The feat astonishes both Tamiya and Kanad, and after their outburst, Rain flies off to search for slimes as the two watch over his body. Eventually, Rain locates the swarm of slimes, and before they begin the job, Tamiya asks Rain if he can use any magical spells. Rain answers that he can use Fireball and Heal, which under Tamiya's suggestion, casts Fireball against the slimes, eliminating every last one of them. The outcome astounds Rain and Kanad, but not Tanya, who explains that Rain's abilities have risen since making a contract with her. Just then, more slimes appear at the scene, and following Tanya's tuition, Rain learns how to control his magic better. Afterward, Tanya and Kanad talk to a little girl outside the Adventurer's Guild, informing her that they successfully completed a slime subjugation quest. Rain then joins the two girls, and after a stroll through the town throughout the day that night, the group enjoys dinner at a restaurant. Once they're finished, Rain reveals the background of his home village and how it was lost one day due to a monster attack. A group of adventurers would rescue Rain, and he was relocated to an inn where he worked his keep for years until Ario's group recruited him. He joined the group without hesitation, believing it'd be for the better and would allow him to prevent the same tragedy that happened to his village. However, the group thought of him as a useless tag-along, leading to his dismissal from the hero's party. Hearing this story saddens both Tamiya and Kanad, but they note their fury against the hero party for how they treated Rain, but he assures them that it's all behind him. The day after, Rain's group subjugates a bunch of orcs, one of whom manages to stab Rain in his arm with a knife while trying to protect Tanya. Assuring that he's fine, Rain then uses heal on himself, instantly heals the wound, and suggests they collect the magical ores the orc left behind and turn them into the Adventurer's Guild. That afternoon, Rain does this and learns from Kanai that Tanya had wanted some time alone to herself. Tanya stood on a bridge gazing at the flowing river water below, pondering whether or not she had done the right thing, and then a little girl from the other day approached and talked to her. Tanya would have a brief heart-to-heart -heart with the little girl that lifted her spirits. Soon, Rain finds Tanya, who formally apologizes to him for her actions earlier that day. On the other hand, Rain notes his relief from being able to find Tanya, and that night, Kanade realizes her feelings for Rain, but would flatly deny them as a fondness for him. The following day, after another successful quest was completed, Tanya suggested to Rain that they purchase new equipment, and Rain liked the idea. Before they're able to progress any further, Arios and his party confront Rain on the road and give him a sarcastic greeting. 
and Rain immediately suggests they take a different route. Arios makes some disparaging remarks as well Kanade and Tamiya step in to defend their master. Tamiya then questions Arios group's identity as that of the hero party. Disliking Tamiya's tone, Arios tries to rebuke her but realizes that she and Kanad are, respectively, a dragonoid and cat spirit. With Arios party that their reigns tamed monsters, Rain asks what business they have for him. And Arios claims that due to the difficulty of the Lost Woods, they had to withdraw from it. Hence, Arios offers an olive branch to Rain, allowing him to rejoin his group despite his uselessness. Agath, Lean, and Mina then all comment that Rain should be grateful for them allowing him to rejoin their group. However, Rain refuses their offer, but Lini tries to convince him, claiming a relic called the Shield of Truth located in the forest would allow them a fighting chance against the Demon King. Furthermore, Lina mentions that monsters would swarm and attack settlements without that relic, which triggers memories of Rain's past. Under pressure, Rain quietly agrees to it and Ario's group chastises him for not accepting from the start. As Ario's group starts to walk off, both Kaned and Tania stop the hero party and demand that they properly apologize to Rain by groveling. The suggestion shocks the hero party and Tania threatens to incinerate them with her breath if they don't voice their disdain at it. Grabbing Rain by the cuff of his collar, Arios demands that he keep his pets on a shorter leash, which the pet remark upsets Rain. However, Arios insists on it and tries to make him confess that they're not his pets but insinuates they're his lovers causing Rain to punch Arios. With that, Arios challenges Rain and his tamed monsters to a duel to see who is stronger, and Rain accepts it. In separate locations, Kanad faces off against Agathe, Tania faces off against Mina and Lean, and Rain faces off against Arios. Kanade's fight starts first and Agath is happy that he has to fight against an ultimate species such as her, and Kanan vows to beat him up and make him apologize to Rain. On the other hand, Agath has no intention of doing so, hence, Kanade starts the fight with a quick and powerful kick followed by a flurry of punches. Agath manages to defend against the attacks with his broad sword, but is quickly overwhelmed by her attacks. Kanai then comments that Agath hasn't made a single move against her, which is surprising as he's part of the hero party. The remark triggers Agath, who finally counterattacks with his special move Hellfire and Brimstone Slash. However, Kanan easily deflects the attack. Furious by this turn of events, Agath proclaims he'll fight with his full strength, and Kanan proclaims she'll fight with half her own. The revelation shocks Agath that Kanan hasn't been using even half of her strength thus far, and she quickly ends the fight with a single kick. Elsewhere, Tanya faces off against Lean and Mina, who openly claims she'd prefer fighting Arios than those two because they're so weak. Tanya's remark upsets the two mages, and they cast Gravity Burst and Holy Flare. By snapping her hand, however, Tanya dispels the attacks. Thus, Lian and Mina respectively cast Judgment Arrow and Red Crimson again. Tanya dispels the attacks with a snap of her fingers and claims she used what is called Materia Canceller. Refusing to believe they're beaten, Mina and Lian cast multiple spells against Tanya. However, she dispels them with Materia Canceller. To finish things off, Tanya casts the epic spell Ultimate End against the two, but it's a fake-out, making them pass out. On Rain's side, he faces off against Arios, who forces him back with his swift swordplay. Despite this, however, Rain only takes minor scratches from the attacks and notes how underwhelming the pressure Ario is giving off compared to Tanya. Rain then attacks Arios with a punch to the gut, which winded him, and Rain reveals that forming contracts with Kanade and Tanya granted him newfound power. Utilizing the analytics he's gathered from his observations of Arios and with the help of an Orbi, Rain wins his fight against Arios. Moments later, Tanya and Kanade rush to Rain's side and embrace him. Rain and his party arrive in the dark and dreary Lost Woods, where the Shield of Truth is said to be located. A flashback reveals that after Arios' group was defeated by Rain's, they apologize for their misbehavior. Tanya also intimidates them into making their apology sound more sincere and Rain accepts their apology. With that out of the way, Arios explains the Shield of Truth's current situation within a monster's hands in the Lost Woods. Despite Kanade's and Tanya's rebukes of how Ario's tone of voice sounded as if he was still acting pompously, Rain agrees to accept the task. In the present, Rain assures his two companions of the importance of finding the Shield of Truth for Ario's group. To start their search, Rain assimilates with the bird forms by a temporary contract to scope out the area, leaving Kanade and Tanya in charge of looking after his body. Immediately, Rain locates a pathway leading to their goal, but when they follow it, get lost despite taking the correct path. Tanya casts Material Search to investigate the surrounding area and leads them to a tree emitting illusionary magic, where Tanya asks Kanad to knock it down. Before Kanad can, a disembodied voice demands they leave that place and from the tree. A fairy appears before them. 
Although Rain tries to introduce himself and reveal this group's goal, the fairy refuses to listen and warns them that she'll expel them from the forest if they don't leave. Heeding this warning, Rain, Kanag, and Tanya flee back into the woods to discuss their encounter with the fairy. Kanag recalls that a monster inhabits the tree and Tanya suggests they still break down the tree to remove its illusionary barrier. However, Rain insists he visit and talk with the fairy alone. Approaching the fairy again, Rain tries to start a conversation with her, who threatens to hurt him if he doesn't leave. On the other hand, Rain accepts the threat as he's confident in his monster negotiation capability. As he said, Rain takes and is hurt by the fairy's illusion arrows, perplexing her as Rain's actions contradict how she's known humans to act. Rain admits he's human and not all are the same, but the fairy sends off a second barrage of illusion arrows only for Kanaid and Tanya to protect Rain. Both of them then try and reason with the fairy but get into an argument midway concerning Kanaid's initial approach. Intrigued by the group, the fairy drops her hostility towards the group. Asking for Rain's name, Rain reveals it to the fairy, who in turn introduces herself as Sora and agrees to listen to their plea. From their conversation with Sora, it's learned that the barrier blocks the entryway to the fairy village and that her people protect the Shield of Truth. Learning the Shield of Truth was needed to defeat the Demon King, Sora fetches and gives it to Rain. Despite Rain's offer to help her with anything, Sora flatly rejects it, noting she was merely following the ancient pact between the fairies and the previous hero. Once that was done, Kanaid and Tanya tried and leave, but Rain returned to Sora and asked what was bothering her. Hesitant to answer, Sora is coaxed by Rain, Kanaid, and Tanya talk about her twin sister Runa and their job to protect and maintain the barriers that lead into the fairy village. All was well between the two until they exited the barrier for personal reasons and encountered a monster affiliated with the Demon King army. Rain then details that the monster Sora and her sister Runa encountered was called a Shadow Knight. Although weaker than an ultimate species like them, it has tricky characteristics like magical nullification, making only physical attacks and harm it. Sora confirms it and continues her story where the Shadow Knight demanded that she lower the barrier, but in fear, she fled and was told by the leader to abandon Runa. Hearing Sora's plea, Rain vows to help and rescue Runa from the Shadow Knight, causing Sora to embrace Rain tearfully. A flashback reveals Sora detailing the condition of Sora's release given by the Shadow Knight by lowering the barrier of the fairy village by sundown. Privy to this information, Rain's group heads to the Shadow Knight's location but refuses to allow Sora to tag along as it break her deal with the monster. Reaching the Shadow Knight's location, Rain's group finds it sitting on a throne with Runa, and immediately, Rain casts a fireball against it as a feint. It allows Kanaid and Rain to land a few blows against the Shadow Knight, who realizes that Sora sent Rain's group and then attacks Runa. However, Tamiya protects, releases her from her captivity, and flees the scene carrying her away. After forming a temporary contract with some Orbeez to act as a distraction, Rain casts Boost on Kanad, who utilizes her bolster power to defeat the Shadow Knight. After Rain's explanation of the boost spell to Kanade, Tamiya returns to them, still carrying Runa in her arms. Tanya also notes her perplexion about how Rain knew a powerful lost art, but he claims everyone in his village was privy to it. As Runa awakens, Rain informs her that Sora had asked them to rescue her, making Runa feel relieved. Afterward, Runa embraces Sora, and the two thank Rain's group for their actions. A brief scene concerning Runa's crude thoughts about Rain and Sora's reprimanding of her sister occurs, leading Rain to believe they're polar opposites. Although Kanan had hoped Sora and Runa would return to their village, Sora notes that since Runa had been excommunicated from there, she wants to distance herself from there. Having no place to go or adequate knowledge of the outside world, Kanade invites the fairies to join them. Rain allows it and forms a contract with the two. Later that day, Rain meets the hero's party so he can finish the quest to find and give them the Shield of Truth, while his party secretly watches. However, Arios is flabbergasted how it took Rain's group two days to retrieve the shield and yet it took his own group two weeks. With Arios refusing to acknowledge the Shield of Truth was real, Rain suggests his group examine its authenticity. Lean casts appraisal on it, which shocks everyone in her party that it's the genuine shield and Arios notices the two new faces in Rain's party. Not wanting to create a scene where two fairies are in a human settlement, Rain demands his quest reward and is given his 20 gold coin reward. Before Rain could once again sever ties with the hero's part, Agath stops him and asks if he'd be interested in rejoining the party. Despite Ario's agitation over the offer, Agath realizes the team's inadequacy without Rain's support. Mina and Lean both reluctantly agree with Agath's suggestion and ask if Rain would accept his offer. However, Rain refuses as he's content with his current life. Once Rain had left, Agath, Mina, and Lean opine their disdain for Rain refusing their offer, but Arios, who is still embittered by his defeat against Rain, has him agitated who he vows to eliminate. Elsewhere, 
Underneath a tree, Rain explains to his party about the legend of the first hero who defeated the demon king. Apparently, only one with the blood of the gods can be the hero and have unrestrained potential called Limit Break to be capable of defeating the demon king. Arios was thought of as fairly weak compared to Rain, and Sora notes that he could be the real hero, going on to explain his accomplishments by taming everyone in his party. Kenai then suggests that Rain should tame more spirits, which would grant him enough power to defeat the demon king, and Tanya concurs. On the other hand, Rain declines, noting the responsibilities and how he's only managed to achieve everything thus far thanks to their support. Although Rain doesn't completely dismiss the idea, as it's far too early to decide on such an endeavor. One bright and sunny morning, Rain awakens on the floor of his room and hopes a free room becomes available soon as his party sleeps on the beds. Enjoying breakfast outside, Rain and his party discuss purchasing equipment for him for the journeys ahead, and Rain agrees with it. While walking down the streets of the town, Runa and Sora are alert of the people figuring out that they're fairies. This changes after Rain assures them that they'll be fine and after witnessing the interactions between Kanade and Tanya with some familiar faces. However, when a few children approach them, the girl from the group notes that Runa and Sora are Rain's new wives, which irks Sora. Also, Runa nearly reveals she's a fairy by casting magic, only to be stopped by Rain and Sora. Afterward, the group heads to a weapon store and is greeted by its rough and gruff dwarven owner Gantz, who suggests they pick out a weapon of their choosing. Rain checks out a dagger and notes the odd feeling it projects. A male customer enters the store wanting the store's best sword, and Gantz picks one out for the customer who purchases it. Once the customer left, Rain confronted Gantz about how all his weapons were of poor quality, and the owner confirmed it. Runa and Sora then belittled Gantz as a petty swindler, but he stands up for himself and shows them his best weapons for sale. When asked why he sold his last customer a paltry weapon, Gantz claims it was a test of gumption with weaponry. Furthermore, Gantz explains that most customers waste swords and toss them away when a newer model is released, which would damage his blacksmith spirit. Tanya then has a reciprocating moment with Gantz about their mutual ideals. Once that was settled, Gantz asked how Rain knew his weapons were different. Rain then details his experience as a beast tamer, which relied on astute observation of animals and would unconsciously observe his surroundings. Impressed by Rain's explanation, Gantz agrees to make a custom weapon for him. However, he lacks the materials to do it. Eventually, the group heads to the Adventurer's Guild, where a large group of adventurers surrounds the bulletin board. Natalie informs them that Arios was in Horizon, seeking to recruit new support members. The news doesn't hamper Rain's mood, and he introduces Runa and Sora to Natalie. Runa alludes to Natalie that her relationship with Rain is deeper than a natural one shocks her, making Rain disconcerted and try to explain properly. Progressing things, Rain submits a formal quest from Gantz requesting Mithril Ore. A flashback reveals that the ore may be located in a depleted mine Gantz inherited from his family. Getting assured and pepped by his team, Rain agrees to search Gantz's mind for the ore, and the two formally introduce themselves to each other. When inquired about how much gold he'd like to receive for the quest, Rain requests a new weapon be made instead, which elates Gantz. En route to their destination, Runa and Sora become exhausted by the long trek because of their lack of stamina. Hence, Rain locates a nearby lake, allowing his teammates to take a refreshing bath there. He also temp contracts a couple of squirrels to watch the ladies and notify him if any trouble arises. However, as Rain takes a rest, he hears Kanade scream, rushes to their location, and learns a fish has bitten Kanade's tail. The situation causes Sora to become perturbed, and Rain acts remorseful for his actions. However, he's forgiven by Tanya and Kanade, who brush it off. They know Rain would never lustfully gaze at them. Though they jokingly suggest reversing the roles so they can see him make it to even the score, which he turns down. Upon reaching their destination, Rain suggests they stand to watch close by to the mine's entrance to see if his theory of thieves stealing from the mine is true. A hawk starts circling, making Rain gasp, and a couple of thieves exit the mine demanding that whoever is out there show themselves. Left with no choice but to fight, Rain suggests they beat them and question them after. However, Tanya and Kanad do the opposite. Hence, Sora and Runa use their magic to peer into the thieves' minds to figure out their motives. They learn that Rain's theory is true and that the thieves are associated with five other adventurers within the mine. To make matters worse, Rain suspected that one of the adventurers was a beast tamer from the hawk he spotted was acting as a lookout. Inside the Mithril Mines, the thieves are alerted by their comrades' defeat by the group's beast tamer, who vows to avenge them. Walking through a tunnelway within the cave, Rain's party is then ambushed by four adventurers who quickly deal with Runa, Sora, Tanya, and Kanad. With only the Beast Tamer left, Rian faces off against him and his B-ranked monster behemoth. Despite being a difficult monster to tame, the Beast Tamer boasted that he raised it from its childhood, which circumvented the prerequisites of taming it. 
Reed's fight against the behemoth causes the mine to shake and crumble. Hence, Kanaid and the others take the captured thieves outside for their safety. However, Kanaid returns inside the cave to assist Reed by capturing the Beast Tamer as he handles the behemoth. Although Kanaid restrains the Beast Tamer, he refuses to surrender and has his behemoth continue his rampage. So Rian overwrites the behemoth's contract and causes its original owner to provoke it, making Rian cast a fireball to defeat it. Outside the mine, it's learned that the thieves were out for revenge against Gantz for selling them inferior weapons. This is later relayed to Gantz, who feels remorseful about his judgmental attitude toward the customer he had deemed unworthy of his finer craft. Gantz claims his actions make him a failure as a craftsman and Rian agrees but asks that he make amends by pouring his soul into weapon making again. Moved by Rian's words, Gantz promises to deal honestly with his customers and weapons again. To start his new endeavor, Gantz asks what kind of weapon Rian wants, and he answers he'd like a new dagger and gauntlet. Meanwhile, Arios with Mina close by rejects an applicant for the beast tamer job they posted, citing his inadequacy and skill for taming an ultimate species. As Arios laments over another failed applicant, Mina internally reflects on how Arios failed another worthy applicant because they didn't match Rian's caliber. Worried that their styling hinders the responsibility for defeating the Demon King, Mina asks Arios if he'd amend the criteria for the job post. Mina's suggestion gets an apprehensive response from Arios, so she backtracks it, noting her holy vow to God to follow the hero and leaves it at that. Alone, Arios pulls a cursed ring from his desk and plans to use it to get revenge against Reen. The following day, Reen visits the Adventurer's Guild and learns the Ore Thieves' fate from Natalie, which disheartens him. Exiting the guild, Reen details the news to Runa and Sora, who console the dispirited Reen. Thankful for their kind words, Reen suggests they take a walk before returning home, and they happily agree. Walking down the town street, Reen purchases hot dogs for them all, and Runa and Sora enjoy them. After they're done eating, Runa and Sora ask Reen if had obtained any special skills or abilities by forming a contract with them. However, Reen is uncertain if he did or not, which disconcerts Runa and Sora, but they believe Reen could have obtained ultimate magic, which is greater than advanced or epic magic. Again though, Reen didn't know if he had obtained any new spells, making Runa and Sora depressed. Reen then cheers up Runa and Sora by telling them he doesn't care if they give him new skills or abilities and appreciates their company. The compliment perplexes Runa and Sora as their village once abandoned them and as of now, have yet to display any notable accomplishments since joining his party. Asking why Reen still treats them with dignity and respect, he answers that the lack of trust in his former party caused his expulsion. Hence, Reen wanted to learn from his mistakes and build trust with his new party. Pleased by Reen's answer, they decide to get more hot dogs but are stopped by a pompous man accompanied by two guards, who demand Runa and Sora's names. The pompous man's presence alerts the crowd, and after the fairies give their names, he proclaims he'll make them his. Although met with disdain by Runa and Sora's rejection of him, the pompous noble only declares his love and desire for them even more. Reen then steps in and demands to know the name of the pompous noble, who introduces himself as the Lord of Horizon's son, Edgar Fromware. Despite the fairy twins rejecting Edgar's demand, Edgar surrounds the group with his soldiers and asks again if they will agree to his offer, which Reen again rejects on their behalf. Hence, Edgar orders his soldiers to attack him, but Reen promptly defeats them. Backed into a corner, Edgar orders the remainder of his soldiers to hold the surrounding people as hostages. Disgusted by how Edgar views his subjects, Reen awakens his fairy magic capabilities and rescues the hostages using a multicast fireball spell on the soldiers. This forces Edgar to flee the scene in shame and makes Reen's groupie met with praise. However, one lady in the crowd warns them that they should leave Horizon for their safety as a cloaked individual watches them from afar. Later at the inn, Runa and Sora relay what happened earlier to Kanaid and Tanya. It's speculated that Reen's magical control had dramatically improved by forming a contract with the twins. Their conversation then changes to Edgar's shady background involving him kidnapping and torturing women for his amusement. Edgar apparently gets away with his dirty deeds, thanks to his father's influence as Horizon's lord. While the knights have investigated the accusations against Edgar, they sadly found no evidence of any crimes committed. After deliberating over what to do, it's ultimately decided that Reen and his party will defeat Edgar and save the city. That night, at the Fromware Manor, Edgar talks with his father, and after he excuses himself, Edgar pays his knight Galit to take care of Reen. Once he's gone, Edgar summons a slave servant of his and proceeds to beat her for not meeting his outlandish expectations. The following day, Reen and Kanad visit the Order of Knights HQ to file a formal complaint against Edgar. However, the complaint was formally rejected as the complaint was already reported as a minor scuffle and would not be investigated further. 
Reen would later opine the knights are in cahoots with Edgar. They're then approached by the vice-captain knight named Stella, who requests their help to bring down Edgar. Trusting in Kanae's judgment about her opinion of Stella, Reen agrees to help her while also cleaning out the corruption within the Knights of Order. To catch the corrupt knights in a trap, Stella enlists help from some trusted knights in her division, and Reen gets his new gauntlet from Gantz. By nightfall, a trap is laid in a warehouse rumored to have incriminating evidence against Edgar, and thus the corrupt knights of order are sent to investigate. Once they enter the warehouse, the entrance is sealed off, and the knights, aside from Gullet, are knocked out. Facing off against her superior, Stella tearfully defeats Gullet in one-on-one -on -one combat. Meanwhile, at Fromware Manor, Edgar receives news of Gullet's arrest and takes out his frustration onto his slave servant. The cloaked individual then visits him, who's revealed to be Arios Incognito. Arios explains that Reen is a beast tamer who managed to tame multiple ultimate species to Edgar. He then gives him a cursed ring, under the pretense that it's a magical item that brings death to its target. A brief flashback reveals Nina's past life at her small temple until she was enslaved. A couple of soldiers in front of Edgar's mansion warn Stella and her knights not to trespass any further. However, Stella announces her name and title while proclaiming they're there to conduct an inspection. Furthermore, she mentions that Jellet had been arrested under corruption charges. Since the soldiers refuse to comply with Stella's orders, Tanya and Kanade intervene, causing the two soldiers to alert their comrades that they're under attack. Surrounded by numerous soldiers, Tanya and Kanad break through the main gate as Edgar watches from his room, anticipating his newly acquired ring will help him defeat Reen. Meanwhile, Reen, Runa, and Sora manage to infiltrate the mansion's basement in hopes of rescuing the hostages there. Runa casts Material Search, planning to teleport any hostages they locate out of the mansion magically. Once Runa detects a large magical signature below them, believed to be the hostages, and one of the other signatures is said to be on par with Sora and her. Reen suspects that another ultimate species is held captive there, and decides to have the fairies rescue the hostages while he rescues the ultimate species. Walking through the mansion alone, Reen locates where the ultimate species, which turns out to be Mina, a demigod. Startled by Rian's presence, Nina acts apprehensive toward him as he breaks into her cell and casts a healing spell on her. Thankful for what Rian did, Nina gives her name and then embraces him. Another brief flashback is shown, revealing how Nina became conscripted by Edgar. Back in the present, Nina informs Rian of her situation and he decides to emancipate her. Rian's plan, however, backfires at first since although the slave collar's magic is fundamentally similar to a beast tamer's magic, it's still difficult for him to break. By utilizing the power granted by his tamed friends, Reen manages to break the Slave Collar's spell, which frees Nina. Outside, Stella, her knights, Kanan, and Tanya all continue dealing with the soldiers surrounding the area and are soon joined by Runa and Sora. The fairies inform the others that they've rescued the hostages, who are now at a safe location. Hearing this invigorates both Kanad and Tanya, who continue their onslaught against the soldiers. In his room, Edgar reassures his father that he'll handle the situation alone. In the mansion's foyer, Reen carrying Nina on his back regroups with Stella's group who claim Reen had seduced another girl, much to his chagrin. Edgar's father entered the foyer and was ordered by Stella to surrender himself. He, however, refuses and is sequentially captured by Reen's gauntlet wire. Immediately, Edgar appears and, using the ring that Arios gave him, summons a reaper that stabs him in the chest with its scythe. Standing atop the mansion's roof, Arios gloats about Reen's supposed death and claims he'll now be able to rest easy. After Arios disappears into the night, Reen is revealed unharmed by the Reaper's attack. Sora mentions that Reen was just hit with an instant death spell, yet it did not affect him. Hence, Runa casts a Poison Affliction spell on Reen, which doesn't work, and it corroborates her hypothesis that Reen is immune to status effect magic. Watching from the second floor banister, the despondent Edgar watches the conversation between Reen and his party, while internally lamenting how an entitled noble such as him had failed. Refusing to accept the outcome, some dark, ominous energy escapes from Edgar's ring that engulfs him and transforms the noble into a demon. The demon leaves Edgar's mansion to target the town folks below and determined to stop it, Reen, pursue it. However, Reen has Stella and Nina avoid confrontation with the demon in favor of helping the town folks. Rampaging through the town, the demon is stopped by Kanad and is confronted by Reen's group. Their first efforts against the demon prove futile, and to even the odds. The demon summons monster reinforcements. Despite their efforts to defend themselves against the monsters, the demon casts a spell that destroys parts of the town, setting it on fire. In retaliation, Runa and Sora pin the demon in place with a light magic spell as Reen boosts Kanade and Tanya's powers. The two then launch a barrage of punches against the demon, 
followed by a light spell that flung the demon into the sky. Kana then launches the demon to the ground with a gut punch. However, all he managed to do was blow off its left arm. It then proceeded to summon more monsters and prepared to destroy Horizon. Hence, Runa and Sora volunteered to use their magic to teleport the townsfolk to a safe location. Meanwhile, Mina informs Arios about the rampaging demon in Horizon. However, he refuses to take any action against it, as their main priority is the demon lord. Lean concurs with Arios against Agath and Mina's concern about the demon situation, but ultimately concedes to Arios' logic. Back in Horizon, Stella, accompanied by her knights and Nina, defeats the demon's summoned creatures. They're soon joined by Sora and Runa, who request their assistance with evacuating the townsfolk using teleportation magic. Prior to the fairies' plans, Stella and her knights leave to round up any townsfolk they can find as Nina stays behind with Runa and Sora. Eventually, Stella and her knights gather some townsfolk who initially hesitated to use the fairies' teleportation magic. However, a few familiar faces of the fairies convince them enough to trust in the fairies. Before the second wave of people could be teleported, a pack of the monsters arrived. Returning to Rian's group, Kanade and Tanya become exhausted by fighting against the monsters, but soon get help from the town's adventurers. As that goes on, Runa deals with the newly arrived reinforcements and Sora teleports the remaining townsfolk to safety. Feeling inadequate, Nina joins Rian's group in hopes of helping them. Both Kanade and Tanya realize that Nina could use her demigod powers to teleport Rian close enough to the demon so he could confront it. Carrying Nina on his back, Rian uses Nina's teleportation magic to confront the demon, and after casting Boost on himself, he magically restrains the demon. In doing this, Rian becomes afflicted by the demon's influence but manages to overcome this and overrides the control over the demon's monsters. Enraged, the demon breaks free from his restraints and tries to attack Rian, but is overwhelmed and defeated by its turncoat monsters. Once the demon was defeated, Nina became too exhausted to maintain the two in the air, causing them to fall to the ground. Before they crash land, they're caught by Tanya. Three days pass by since the demon rampaged through Horizon and its townsfolk start rebuilding the town. Stella had since been appointed the new knight's captain. As for Jylet, his accomplices and Edgar's father were moved to the capital to receive formal punishment for their corrupt actions. Man also learns that the people from her village were transported to another location, but she hopes to meet them again one day. As for the remaining party members, they all help with the reconstruction of Horizon.